Okay. So once again, I welcome each and everyone to the third day of our international Hardsweb workshop on global seismology and techniques. I'm glad to observe that the agile and interactive participation of the attendees in the past two sessions have raised the bar and standard of our workshop. May I request all of you to keep the same spirit, please. Keeping in view on the enthusiastic participation of this workshop, we had decided to obtain abstract submission for all the participants. And it gives me immense pleasure to request our Honorable Director, Professor Jean Norhari Sastri, to unveil and release the e-abstract volume containing 20 abstracts submitted by participants from diverse Wait. branches of study within and beyond geology, physics, geophysics, apart from 16 lecture abstracts by the keynote speakers. Dear sir, please unveil and release the e-abstract volume. Over to Professor Jean Norhari Sastri, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, speaker and Ayal and uh, Anthony. Very pleased sir, may you have the permission to release, release the abstract volume, sir? Yes. Please, please. Go. Yes, sir. So, stop. So this is the abstract volume of our workshop, sir. So may I request Professor Sastri, sir, to say a few words, sir. Um, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to note that this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics is uh, really a very, very good effort on the part of uh, NIST with the convenership of uh, Dr. Shantanu Guruva and, and all his colleagues. And I wish this program all the very success. And I thank all the eminent speakers who has taken their time and then uh, speaking in this virtual conference. The advantage of these virtual conferences are a large number of people are listening to this and also the YouTube videos are available. Even after the session, they will be accessible to people. And I thank the organizers and the Shantanu Guru for giving me this opportunity to speak on this occasion and I have the honor of releasing this book of abstract. Thank you very much and I wish the International Virtual Workshop all the very success and then let everybody make the best use of this great opportunity. Thank you very much. Sir, thanks for your kind support and encouragement at all the time, sir. Thank you, sir. So today's lecture shall be presented by Professor Georgi Grujik from Dallas University, Canada. The title of his lecture is Spatial and Temporal Interplay Between Viscous and Brittle Deformational Processes in the Himalayan Megatrust. So before starting his session, may I now request Professor J.R. Kyle to give his initial remarks. Over to Professor Kyle, sir. Thank you so much, Antonu. Thanks to Professor Shastri. Thanks to our chief guest, and speaker, keynote speaker, Professor Guzi, and uh, Dr. Santunu uh, is the convener, our convener. Now the abstract is a really a, a, a momentum work by the working committee. It is a, it is well organized by the organizing committee to you know endorse 16 keynote addresses, abstract of the keynote addresses and some 20 abstracts from the participants who were willing to, you know, uh, to send their research materials to this workshop. So those are also included in this volume. And I hope this volume will be very useful for all of us. This volume contains from global seismic waves to ground motion, to all geophysical aspects of earthquakes and all seismological aspects of earthquakes. And it has dealt very well with the seismology and seismotectonics, you know, globally and also and locally 
those participants, those who have sent their abstract also in this volume. So that way the volume is uh, wonderfully, it has been organized by the organizing committee and thanks to our professor and director of CSI in East, Professor Sastri, to open this abstract. And I think it is his support, his encouragement is, is that uh, which made it this workshop so so attractive to all over the world. I think 30 countries have joined to this workshop and some more than 1000 participants are every day are listening to the lectures of the stallers from different countries of the world. They're all they're all stallers in their own field. So today we will be listening to Professor Ruzix from Canada. He is he be speaking on the very you know intricate problems in the Himalayan megathrust, how the ductile and the brittle behavior of the rocks play in causing the earthquakes. So the Himalaya is a very interesting zone to understand earthquakes and Professor Guzik is going to give us some insight of the interplay between the ductile and brittle rock characteristics in, in terms of earthquake generation, the mega thrust. Professor Guzik, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. May I request Dr. Sorobarwa to say a few words about Dr. Sorobarwa? Yeah, go, good afternoon and good evening to everyone in the present here. I'm very happy to uh, note that this is the first ever E abstract volume that has been inaugurated. Uh, in this seminar, I thank uh, our honorable director, Dr. Jean Alahari Sastri, to inaugurate the same. And it's really indeed a big pleasure for me that Professor Kayal always encourages us by analyzing his thoughtful comments on every science <clears throat> aspect of earthquake seismology. We had already heard Professor Andrew Michael and George Walter Mooney, and that was a fantastic deliberations from both of them. And today we we have with us Professor George Grujic, with whom I had a lot of communication. He is the pioneer of stress transfer and connectivity between the Bhutan Himalaya and the Shillong Plateau. There is a lot of contribution he has made on Bhutan Himalaya, and he has established that there is a more deformation if we compare with the Shong Plateau in this part of Himalaya. Above all, he has compiled and computed the co-seismic stress transfer because of the large earthquake occurred between Bhutan, Himalaya and India. So with that comment, I hand over the platform to Professor Gurjik. Thank you so much. So before uh, before his lecture, now le let me read out a summarized by of Professor George Gurjik. Professor Gurjik is a professor at Dalhousie University, Canada with research interest in interaction between tectonics and surface processes, examination processes, and system tectonics, with expertise in research techniques such as field mapping, analog modeling, numerical modeling, secondary electron microscopy, and electron backscatter diffraction, Raman spectroscopy, etc. Before joining Delhousie University, Professor Guzik served as visiting professor at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Switzerland, University of Lucerne, Switzerland, Stanford University, Princeton University, and many more. He pursued and completed his PhD in Structural Geology and Tectonics from the prestigious Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, Switzerland. Professor Guzik has authored more than 60 papers and 142 publications in conference proceedings. He has served as editorial board member of several journals like Lithosphere, Geology, etc., and he's an editor of the most prestigious journal, Tectronics. Trust me, 
I had a tough time concising his elaborate bio data and sincere apologies for leaving out several achievements. Let me inform the participant that Professor Gruzik has carried out extensive studies on tectonics of Bhutan and Northeast India. I conclude here and request Professor Gruzik for his lecture. Thank you, sir. Over to Gruzik. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, presentations, but first of all, thank you for invitation to participate at this workshop. Thank you to Santana Barua to organizing it, and I congratulate to him and all his colleagues that helped him uh, that this uh, event comes through and that it runs smoothly. Um, I don't want to spend more time on um, introduction. I would like to start then and I first of all I would like to greet you from East Coast Canada where sun is just rising at the moment so it is a uh, quite early in the day and I hope I'm not mumbling too much that I'm not clear but um, although it is a um, video conference if you don't follow me if you have any questions feel free to interrupt me. And also I would ask uh, Santanu or somebody of organizers, if you notice any technical problem, then feel free to stop me and we'll try to mediate that. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'll be talking about the Himalayan Megatrust and I'll particularly um, talk about the part of the deformation in its deeper part in a ductile part and the thing is that we know that along megatrust like in the subduction zones but also in the continental setting and the Himalaya represent probably the only large megatrust in the continental setting and in being active setting that allow us to actively study the deformation in the front of the Himalayan, but also to observe the seismic deformation in some of the deeper part. On the same time, we are also fortunate to have exposure of the deeper part where the ductal deformation was happening. Although we are talking, and all my colleagues will be talking mostly about the seismic events, we know that the stresses to accumulate enough stress in the seismic part, the stress is actually being loaded by the continuous displacement along the ductal part into the transitional zone, the brittle ductal deformation part into the sir? seismic part. Yes. Sir? Yes. Uh, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so actually your presentation is not coming. Okay, right now it is coming. Okay, sir. Yeah, okay. But, that's, uh, but then still I'll... it is uh, not full screen. Okay, I'll do it in this way. So let me just check for the. Do you see next slide? Yes, sir, it is coming. Okay, so the slides are changing now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good, so I'll stay in this mode. Let me just check something more. So I request you to make it full screen before sharing, sir. Like this now? The so slides, slides are changing, change. sir. Yeah. Yes, the okay. slides are changing. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So again, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so this situation that we have this sir, meta trust. Yeah. Sir, your screen is not full screen, that means. 
Her presentation is not full screen. Oh, on my Sir, side, can you, please. Yeah. What do you see? Sir, first of all, you make it uh, full screen. Thereafter, you share it to Teams app. Yeah, it is. It is on my side. Okay. It's full screen. So, can you tell me what you are seeing when I go? Now nothing. No, now nothing is coming, sir. Now, what do you see? Yeah, but what do you see now? It, presentation is there, sir, but it is but it is split screen. I see. I see. Now. No, oh, I know. I will change something. Okay. How it is now? Hello? Can you please confirm? What do you see now? Yes, sir. Uh, so yes, sir. You can go ahead. Sir. <clears throat> Good. So sorry for this technical problem. I was working on two screens, and probably that's something in this setup that doesn't work. Good. So another issue or another phenomenon that is typical for the Himalayas is the so-called inverted temperature field. And we can see it very clearly on this metamorphic map of the Bhutan Himalaya, where we can see the metamorphic zonation from south to north to increase from the sub Grinch spaces mm, to high Grinch spaces. It is not coming? No, the Bhutan slide has not come. Your last slide is there, but the second slide has not come. Do you see slice changing? No, not coming. Huh. That is sorry, please, uh, sir. Plus, first you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Close it. Now down. it has come. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. 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 It is. It is coming now. Yes. Can you tell me what do you see? It has come that you know Bhutan, Eastern Bhutan peak temperatures. That slide has come. And you don't see any changes now. No, it's fine now. Yeah. It is changing, sir. It is changing now. So do you see yeah. the full screen? Yeah. It, it is not full screen though. Huh. You have to click that cup to make it yes. full screen. Yes, I see. For my side, is full screen. Oh, I'm on a full screen, okay. and I'm sharing. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Now I'm not full screen. Okay. Okay. That 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 will do. Can you just tell me what you see? Metamorphic map of Bhutan Himalaya. Yeah, good. And now, did it change? Not Eastern yet. Eastern Bhutan. Okay. 
This is metamorphic map of the Bhutan Himalayas. Did it change now? Yeah, it changed. Eastern, Hima Eastern Bhutan, peak temperatures. No, it should be something very different. Yeah. Now it is, no, it is from one thermal spectroscopy on carbonaceous material. Okay, so I think there is a huge delay. Yeah, li little bit delay. Eastern Bhutan peak temperatures. Good, so I'm on that slide. So let's try. I don't know okay. what might be the problem because I'm uh, using this interface to teach. So normally it is okay. So something is not functioning properly today. <clears throat> Good. So I mentioned that from the main center trust, which we can see here in the eastern Bhutan and until the main boundary trust in the southern Bhutan, we have the tectonic unit called Lesser Himalayan Sequence. And in that unit, there is a progressive change of metamorphism from the lower green schist to upper green schist. That means that affects not only the Lesser Himalayan, but also the main central trust zone. And in order to investigate that, uh, we have collected a large number of samples which we analyze in order to obtain the both peak metamorphic temperatures, but also temperature deformation along the main structures. Both along the main boundary truss, we can see here in the southern Bhutan, where the Gondwana um, sequence sediments were trussed over the Shivalik neogen sediments. Okay, we can see here the fault gouge on the main boundary trust, while at the MCT, we see these myelinites and even some ultramyelinites. We used a quite a range of thermometers to determine either the metamorphic temperature or the temperature of deformation. I'm just showing them here to give you impression about the distribution of the data, but I'll describe them in the following slides. Um, just to mention that most of the work what I'm presenting here has been published this spring in Tectonics for anybody who is interested to read in more detail. I will show also the data along the cross section that is running exactly here. And this is the cross section from south to north. Before I continue, can you just please confirm that you're seeing the cross section? Yeah. Eastern, okay, Eastern Bhutan peak temperatures, yeah. Thank you. Good. So from south to north, again, here's the main frontal trust, the main boundary trust, and the main central trust. And the data I'm presenting are distributed here, and eventually I'll concentrate on what is happening exactly in this zone along the main central trust, but mostly in its footfall. We have collected, as I said, different types of data, and the first main set of data are obtained by Rama spectroscopy on carbonaceous material. These are these data in blue, and these temperatures can be plotted either in cross section or, more correctly, on a structural section where we plot the same data with respect to the structural distance from the MCT. So for that, it was important to have a correct cross-section to correct the correct structural distances. And here, the same data plot with the temperature in the vertical axis and horizontal axis is the structural distance. On this diagram, it, they are plot with respect to the main boundary truss, but I'll switch later on, zoom in into this area. What is important to see here is the peak temperatures do not change with the structural distance in the lower part of the section, in the southern or outer lesser Himalayan. Then, like in most of the India and Nepal, between the main central trust and main boundary trust, there is another trust, which in the eastern Bhutan is called Shumar Trust, but very likely corresponds to the Ramgar Trust 
in the Western India. Uh, we'll zoom into this area here where the data are plot with the structural distance from the main, main central trust. And there is a nice linear correlation between the temperature and distance, which gives us an apparent structural temperature gradient of about 25 degrees per kilometer. We can plot this data also now where the temperature is horizontal axis, vertical axis is the distance. This is the main central thrust, and then we are going down, structurally down from the main central thrust. And the same data show what I mentioned earlier and didn't describe it properly because of the technical problems is that there is this upward increase of temperatures from about 350 degrees, three to four kilometers below the main central thrust, thrust, thrust to about 520 degrees at the main central thrust itself. And this is this inverted temperature gradient we are talking about when we investigate the metamorphism, but also temperature conditions in the Himalayas. And eventually, I'll come back to the implications in sense of stresses along the um, main Himalayan trust, along the Himalayan mega trust, and how does this feature influences actually the stresses also at the transition zone between the ductile deformation, between the viscous deformation, and between the brittle deformation, the seismic deformation. Now, these data apparently have a good linear uh, relationship, but what we want is to relate these temperatures, which are apparently peak metamorphic temperatures, also to the deformation conditions, to the temperature of deformation. In order to do that, we studied the quartz texture by measuring the C axis of quartz. And these data are plot in sample reference frame. This is the foliation, which is vertical in this case, and the lineation is horizontal. And this pattern of distribution of the C axis tells us many different things. One is the kinematics, the sensor movement. In all these diagrams, there is a shearing of top to the left, which in geographic coordinates corresponds to top to the south. Then distribution of maxima, this pattern of distribution tell us the deformation mechanisms, which are function of the temperature. And what I'm showing here, that there are also um, in many cases, two girdles two linear, apparently linear distributions along the planes of the C-axis, and we, they intersect at a particular angle, and that angle is called opening angle. And the degree, the amount of this opening, is also a function of the temperature. We calculated these temperatures on section segment of, of series of quartzite samples, and these are the temperatures that we obtain. Again, there is an increase from about 350 degrees, three, four kilometers below the MC3, MCT, and these temperatures increase to about 450 degrees at the MCT. These are now really deformation temperatures, the temperature that cause the formation of this quartz microstructure. And we can see that the quartz opening angle, temp thermometry, and Raman spectroscopy thermometry are um, corresponding very closely to each other. I plot the arrow bars for the opening angle, but for clarity, I omitted that on the Raman spectroscopy data, but they are virtually on the same order, plus minus 25 to plus minus 50 degrees. These are empirical data or empirical thermometer. So I used also a quantitative thermometer by measuring the titanium concentration in quartzite. Because when we look closer, when we look at a microstructure in optical micro micrographs, we see when we zoom in that there are two microstructures. There are coarser grains of quartz 
and finer grains of quartz. These develop at high temperature and these develop at lower temperature and they're more localized. So there is what you say a retrograde or print during the cooling. The deformation occurred at some peak temperatures. However, during the cooling, the deformation continued, but deformation mechanisms changed. We also can look a little bit closer. Is now 100 microns. For the scale, here the grains of quartz image with cathodal luminescence, and we see that there is a gray shading in the quartz. The luminescence is not the same in the whole grains, particularly around the grain boundaries, but also within the grains, there is a patchy distribution of luminescence, and it is known that the major control on luminescence for the quartz is the concentration of titanium. So we apply this thermometer, titanium in quartz thermometry, also known as titanic, which is the thermobarometry because the temperature as determined from the concentration of titanium is function also on the pressure and also on the activity of titanium. Therefore, it is not a straightforward application, just measuring the amount of titanium and then calculating temperature, but we have to solve for several unknowns at the same time. That is, we want to obtain the temperature, but we also have to know the pressure and uh, of the, at which this temperature was registered, but also the activity of titanium in quartz at that moment. I'm not going to the details, just to say that for that we had to um, perform thermodynamic modeling to solve this problem. And here are the results, again on the same diagram, uh, the temperature obtained in the course of quartz range from about 320 to 400 degrees, and the temperatures in paler red are those obtained in the rims of the quartz. So during the dynamic crystallization, during the deformation, during the plastic deformation or quartz, there was a progressive decrease of temperature of, of, on the order of about 25, some cases 50 degrees. Okay. So we plot now all the data and we see that in the same structural level, we obtain a range of temperatures from peak temperatures to retrograde temperatures. So the microstructures show us the evolution of the temperature, the progressive cooling, but still with ongoing crystal plastic deformation. The other thing that we want to know is the timing where this, this happened, because we'll not need that eventually to determine the deformation rates, the strain rates. Okay. In order to do that, we perform that, in order to de determine the timing of the deformation, we performed three-dimensional thermokinematic modeling using software called PQ. In this type of modeling, this is one output where this is the depth and this is the horizontal distance, and here is the real topography. It's just a two-dimensional section, but the models are actually three-dimensional. In this model, which is interactive, we at the same time search for the optimal geometry of the basal detachment. This is a solution that's obtained, not the initial input completely. We see a ramp, flat, and then frontal ramp. And at the same time, then by choosing appropriate rock thermal properties and thermal boundary conditions, that's the temperature of the base, and surface erosion, we can then determine the evolution of the temperature field. You can see here's the isotherms in white lines, colored code for the temperatures from 750 degrees at the base of the model to the temperature at the surface, which is again real temperature from 25 degrees in Poland to zero degrees at the top of the Tibetan plateau. What we can see immediately from just looking at this image is that the ductile deformation, the displacement, the thrusting along a, a ductile shear zone can cause inverted syntectonic isotherms. So even by the deformation, not by deformation of the pre-registered 
frozen in isotherms, the isotherms are actually deformed and inverted in the real time. Synthetically, they are in, deformed. And what we are looking at in this first part of the discussion is actually this domain here. And how the temperatures in this domain evolved and how did it affect this um, inverted temperature field gradient and how did then eventually that affect the um, transfer of the stresses into the seismic domain. Okay. Just one observation without going into too much detail is that we can normalize that into the uh, this observation into the dimensionless numbers. And this temperature field is controlled by two of them virtually, which on the other hand contain all the temperature properties and kinematic properties that is specklet number which is a ratio between advection of the heat, how it is transferred physically and diffusion by condu conduction. So heat is lost to the top and um, to the bottom. The other uh, parameter is the Brinkman number, which is a relative importance of the viscous dissipation or also known as shear heating because there is also heat production along the shears on due to the plastic deformation because of the shearing. And at the same time, this is this temperature is lost by the diffusion. Okay. Final component of this modeling is the age prediction model. So what we do is we input all the thermal chronometry observations from muscovite to argon argon system, apatite and zircon fission tracks, and apatite and zircon uranium thorium helium. So we have a wide range of closure temperatures for these systems from over 400 degrees, maybe 500 degrees to around 70 degrees. These input parameters are then used to optimize all the other parameters to find the solution that predicts faithfully the observations and produces the temperature field or deformational field what you are interested in. Again, without looking into the details, the same area in Bhutan and Arunachal Pradesh here, we have a large range of the data from the south to the north, from zircon uh, lead dates, late urine lead data, muscovite, argon argon, zircon helium, appetite fission track, and appetite urine thorium helium data. Uh, these are just outputs from the last and optimal. Uh, experiments. There, these are the ages in the vertical uh, scale, and horizontal is the distance from south to north. The orange dots or circles are observations, and the blue line are the predictions by the model. And we see that the predictions, in particular, where we have a lot of observations, the prediction in blue line fits very nicely the distribution of the observations. So in order to get there, we needed to perform tens of thousands of experiments. So it is an um, experiment that lasts several months. What is important also is to observe that the temperatures are not registered in the rocks along the transect at the same time, or the same temperature is not registered at the same time everywhere along the cross section. And that's something very important to realize, not only in this case, but everywhere. So this is the age, this is the temperature, so time temperature diagram, and these lines are the time temperature histories of different points across the cross sections. Was there any comment there? No, good. And so what we see from south to north in the MCT zone, there is a progressive younging of the same temperature. So the same temperature was observed earlier in summer, uh, south and later in the north. That means that the peak temperature is diachronous. It, it is not observed everywhere in the same time, but also what we can see is that these time temperature histories change and they change differently 
for different points along the cross section. That means that both the cooling grades, geothermal gradients, and all the other observations are transient. So there is no one geothermal gradient for one active origin. It changes both in space and also in time. That means we cannot just assume a typical geothermal gradient or a typical cooling grade. It is not representative. We can maybe say something in the average sense, but it is not what is really happening. So we have to actually calculate these transient conditions for any moment of time. And we see that over the last 12, 40 million years, all these parameters changed significantly. We can now take these calculations and the same diagram what I shown before, the distance from the main central thrust and the temperatures. From the previous models, we calculated that the cooling rate at the MCT in the period between 12 and 15, uh, 13 million years was an order of 82 degrees Celsius per million years. That means that the closure temperature of argon system was 480 degrees. So we didn't just infer it, what is uh, typical, but for the particular place and particular time, we calculate the cooling rate, and from that, then we calculate the closure temperature. So we can now plot all the other data, <clears throat> and what we can see, now we have the temperature observations and the timing in green, and we can see that these temperatures, the peak deformation temperatures, were acquired at this period between 12 and 30 million years, and the lower temperatures of steel ducta deformations were acquired at around 11 to 12 million years ago. So this cooling by about 100 to 150 degrees was achieved on the order of one to two million years. <clears throat> Another thing that we can see in this, this diagram, and what I tried to say in the previous ones, is that the same temperature, for example, here, 480 degrees, was acquired four kilometers below the MCT at 30 million years, while the same temperature at the MCT itself was acquired about half a million years later. So there is a, this time gradient as well on the order of half a million years, maybe maximum one million years across a shear zone. Looking different ways, again, sorry to switch in, but just co comparing now different diagrams. This is the diagram I showed you before. Uh, so these are the data along the main central thrust and the data for the south in the, at the base of the upper section of the uh, lesser hema sequence in the vicinity of the Ramgar Trust, we see that the temperature there and the cooling through the Muscovite closure temperature was achieved earlier than the cooling uh, along the main central thrust. So there is a progressive younging of the temperatures, but at the same time deformation from um, lower uh, structural sections to the higher structure sections. Okay. Now, what does it mean in terms of what I said at the very beginning, that ductile deformation, the continuous slip in the ductile part is transferring stresses into the brittle, into the seismic part. In order to quantify that, we had now from this data, what I've shown before, to calculate the flow stresses. So we're going back to the same area, but we are using now higher uh, density of quartzite samples on the same sections on which we collected the previous data. Now the task is to determine the strength profile, and this is a typical very simplified diagram through a crust where the horizontal axis is the stress, either flow stress for the ductile part or differential stress for the brittle part, and is normally expressed in the megapascals, and vertical axis is the depth from the surface 
to deeper in the crust, but also the temperature. Okay, and the progressive increase of temperature with depth. This is an equation for the flow of quartzite as proposed by Hirt et al. in 2001. So what this uh, equation says is that the strain rate is function of these many parameters. What we can see immediately that there are many unknowns. So this is something that we want to calculate, but in order to do that, they are in bold these four sets of unknowns. Other parameters are the known, the material parameter, which is determined from the experiments, the water fugacity exponent, the activation energy, and the gas constant. There are the parameters that are either uh, very precisely determined for any material or are determined for the quartz through the experiments. For any real case, we have to determine then these uh, things in a bold. So what I said until now, <clears> or <throat> the previous part of the talk, was to determine the temperature. Okay. The next, what we have to determine is the stress, the differential stress or the flow stress. To do that, we use uh, the quartz dynamic crystallization mechanisms, the shapes of the grains to tell us what was the deformation. And here what we are looking at is the micrograph, here's a one millimeter for the scale, which is obtained by electron back scattered diffraction, EBSD, where the colors actually show the crystallographic orientations. The difference is in crystallographic orientations. Same time, this type of imaging allows us to very precisely map the grains and or subgrains. So this is much more precise analysis than by optical analysis. We can use these data here plot in a map view to calculate also the crystallographic preferred orientation diagrams. Here are the samples along the cross section and different crystallographic directions, but I'll not go into these details today. Uh, I briefly mentioned that the patterns of distribution of different crystallographic axes allow us to determine the slip systems, which are the function of the temperature, but also strain rate. So coming back to this image, I said that EBSD imaging allow us to recognize the grains, and when we analyze the grain size from this image or from the sample, this the distribution of the grain sizes in microns, so there's a mean grain size, this is a normalized frequency on the KD diagram, and we see that there's a bimodal distribution of grain sizes. There are larger grains with a broad spectrum of the sizes, and there are smaller grains which are smaller than 20 microns in every summer around 12, 15 microns. This is one way to do it, but even better to do that is to actually map out the original grains, which are in the yellow, and recrystallize grains, which are in the blue. And this is done by measuring the density of lattice distor distortion, which is again obtained by the EBSD imaging. So when we determine now the grain sizes, we can from them use them as a piezometer, calculate the stresses. So for each sample, we calculate the grain size and from that the differential of flow stress according to this equation. As I shown you in the previous diagram, there are also two generation of quartz grains, the original grains, the larger ones, and the smaller ones. So we did this exercise, this measurement, for all grain sizes. <clears throat> There's just one more unknown. And we know that the deformation of any materials, any rocks, any minerals, is very highly dependent on the water fugacity, the water content. So although we determine this, 
well and the temperature as well, we still need to know the pressure. Problem is that we cannot apply thermobarometry and another problem is that we have to know the pressure at each instant of time. So for each temperature, for each sample, we have to know the pressure. And to do, do that, we again use this diagram, this data, our distribution of the temperature with depth and the thermomechanical modeling of thermochronological data. We, we obtained these curves. <coughs> Uh, from the modeling, we obtain the temperature, evolution with time, which at the same time allows us to calculate the depth with time or pressure with time. So for each temperature and each sample, we can then determine at which depth or at which pressure were these samples at a given time or at a given temperature. And from that, <coughs> then, sorry, from that, then we could calculate the fugacity, and now we have all the parameters that we need to calculate the strain rate. And the corresponding diagram looks like this. So we have, again, the flow stresses and the temperatures that increase down. And these are the calculated flow stresses for the larger grains, for the high temperature grains, and these are the flow stresses for the smaller grains. We can fit then the curves, the theoretical curves of strain rates according to equation by Hirt et al. That, uh, Hirt et al. that I've shown you before. And we see that there is a <coughs> range of strain rates between 10 to minus 12 to even 10 to minus 15. But the majority is in this typical range of strain rates between minus 12 and minus 13, which is typical for she zones. Okay. However, there's a problem here. You see here that for the large grains, there is a relatively narrow range of flow stresses, 20, 30, maybe 40 megapascals, but there is a high range of strain rates minus 12 to minus 15, which correspond to range of temperatures. In these diagrams, now I'm coming to the problem, I said the temperature increases with depth according to age of thermal gradient, but one is that I told you before that there is no steady state geothermal gradient, it changes with time and space. Another important thing that we saw before is that the temperature increases with the structural distance. So we have high temperatures near to the MCT, lower temperatures down. And this is inverted temperature gradient. So the temperature is actually increasing wrong way okay, from the top of the section to the base of the section. So it is increase the temperature, but it is actually down the section. Okay, so this is deeper point and this is a shallower point. I also told you that this range of temperature and range of changes along a section occurs also within about half a million years. So this is not a snapshot at the same time, but there is also a difference in time when these two points acquired these temperatures and also when they operated at these flow stresses. So this is for the large grains. For the small grains, dynamically recrystallized uh, grains, they formed at a smaller temperature, which are here. There is a narrower range of the temperatures, therefore the narrow range of the <coughs> strain rates and the uh, maximum stresses that indicate e are on the order of 110 megapascals. That, that change from these low stresses to high stresses occurred within one to two million years, as we determined before. Okay. What is missing now in this diagram is the depth 
we cannot convert this observation directly into the depth because there is no bond geothermal gradient. And also these points here are actually upside down. This is shallower, this is deeper. <clears throat> In order to connect, sorry. In order to connect now these observations to the depth and now to the brittle deformation, I'm finally approaching the point of this talk, we go back to our thermal kinematic modeling. This is a temperature field, depth and distance, and this is the optimal solution for the shape of the main human trust in the eastern Bhutan. Here are the isotherms at around 12 million years, because they develop with the time. And here is the isotherm of 400 degrees. Okay. 400 degrees or 350 degrees is the lowest temperature at which we observe the ductile deformation. And this ductile deformation, again, is along the main center thrust, along the main human thrust. So we know now, or we can calculate, the position of these points along the main human thrust at that time and at these temperatures. And these were actually at 12 kilometers, 11 to 12 kilometers. Now we can put the vertical axis. But these two axes, the vertical axis, the depth from 0 to 20, doesn't fit to the temperature field. Please keep that in mind. Okay. So now we can transition from the brittle part, uh, so, sorry, from the ductile part, the viscous deformation, to the brittle deformation. And these are the slopes of differential stress increase with depth according to the Bayerly law for different um, fluid pressure or actually ratio between the fluid pressure and here hydrostatic pressure and lithostatic pressure. So this would be the for the dry rocks. This would be for the hydrostatic pressure which is a maximum hydrostatic pressure um, on the ratio of 0 0.4, and this for the typical wet rocks, 0 0.7. But we can see that this curve for the brittle deformation is far away from the highest flow stresses that we registered at one, uh, 11 to 12 million years at 300 to 400 degrees temperature. We can then go down or increase the fluid pressure. And then we see that at fluid pressure of 0 0.8 or even 0 0.9, there is a fit of observations of the maximum flow stresses and the potential uh, stresses in the transition into the brittle deformation. So when I just jump back, sorry, to this diagram, so the transition or when the two curves cut each other for the flow low and for the barley low, this intersection marks the brittle ductile transition. And this brittle ductile transition along the main human thrust apparently occurs with a high, very high fluid pressure. 0 0.8 and even 0 0.9 is possible. Is it possible for the Himalayas? Well, we have to look at uh, completely different study. We can study the shape of the Himalayan wedge or the brittle part. So we can apply the uh, theory of the critical taper angle. We don't apply it for the ductile part, only for the brittle part. And it is based on observation of the surface slope of the orogenic wedge and the angle of the base of the common. There is a diagram which shows the relation with the surface slope, this angle alpha, and the uh, basal decolement, and there's a range of observations in the Himalayas. These two angles, alpha and beta, are related to these three parameters, coefficient of internal friction, and I'll come back to the next diagram, to some material properties and what is important to what I said before to the pore fluid pressure ratio. And we see that observations in the Himalaya actually do fit for a very high pore fluid pressure. These are observations for the angles of the surface 
or the basal detachment, the whole Himalayas, but along the in the eastern Bhutan, these are the optimal angles. So we see that just from observations of the geometry of the orogenic wedge, we can infer something about the fluid pressure, which is very high in the Himalayas. Okay. So we can confidently say that this brittle ductile transition, so or ductile to brittle transition, in at least in the eastern Bhutan on the main Himalayan trust, occurred at the differential stresses or around 110, 120 megapascals in conditions of very high fluid pressure and at depth of 11 to 12 kilometers. Okay. Now we can go back or go to the next diagram, which is a typical diagram that we use to defer in, to study the differential stresses in the brittle domain. In this diagram, the vertical axis is the shear stress and the horizontal is the normal stress. And we can construct then a circle. The size of this circle is the differential stress, the difference between sigma 3 and sigma 1. And this circle shows that the surface stresses, the normal stress and shear stress, along a fault of any given orientation, and orientation of MHT is given here with this red dot. Now, how do we construct this circle? The only thing that you know is the differential stress, the diameter of this circle, which from previous diagram, we says it is 110 megapascal. That's difference between sigma one and sigma three. Because it's, it's a trust system, the vertical stress, which in the trust system is the sigma one, is simply the product of the density of the rocks, acceleration due to the gravity and the depth. We know the depth, 11 kilometers. We know the density of the rocks, and uh, sorry, and uh, sorry, we know the density of rocks and the acceleration due to the gravity. So we know that the stress at that depth for these rocks is on an order of 280 megapascals. We know the differential stress, so we get then the magnitude of sigma one, which is 400 megapascals. The previous diagram, again, just to remind you, uh, what we are looking here is the differential stress or the flow stress. Here we are looking at the magnitudes of the stresses. Another thing in the more diagrams is there are these lines here which separate the stable field, uh, sorry, stable field, below these lines is a stable field and above is the unstable field. So if you have a more circle or state of stress at a uh, position in a crust, we see that any plane along that state of stress is stable. None of them is near to any of the envelopes, any of these lines. This is a typical Bayer-Lewis law for the internal friction of 0.85. That's one of the uh, uh, parameters I mentioned in the analysis of critical taper. We can also assume along the shear zones, much lower angle of, of um, sliding friction along the existing fault. And even then, these conditions are stable. We have now to remember that there is also a very high fluid pressure. So we can calculate the effective fluid pressure for the lambda of 0 0.85. And if then we apply this fluid pressure in general, what is happening that the state of stress is moving to the left. And for this fluid pressure that we determine independently by two methods, brings the state of stress exactly to the position that the main Himalayan thrust is along the um, slope, along the envelope, for the stability for the low angle of friction, which is again independently determined for the Himalayas. We independently determine this, determine the differential stress, and we put all that together. We see that along the main Himalayan trust, the differential stress is 110, but the effective stress is now 
are much lower, 45, maybe 50 megapascals. That's the normal stress, but the she stresses are even lower on the order of 20 megapascals. I'm concluding here. So what does it says is that the brittle deformation and all these conditions here indicate that the main hemorrhage truss is actually very weak. And this is my concluding slide, and Santana will be happy to see it because we worked on that hard just a couple of years ago. It is the outcrop on the border between Bhutan and Assam, actually on the Assamese side, where is the outcrop in the Shivalik sediments and quaternary sediments in, of the Himalayan foreland. And here is a thrust, main frontal thrust, which was caused by the earthquake in 1714 and caused the displacement on the order 11 to 12 meters, just in one event. So although the MHT is weak, very low differential stresses or effective stresses, still it is capable of producing very large earthquakes. I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry for any technical issues that occurred at the beginning, and I hope you could follow me properly. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your informative and very engrossing lecture. Now, may I request our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, to say a few words of Dr. J.R. Kyle. Yes, thank you, Santanu. I think <coughs> it has been a, an enormous work with enormous samples and data to come out with the, you know, with the Kispik of study to come out with this strain rate and stress and then the ductile deformation and the brittle deformation in the rock and the characteristics of the MHT in the Bhutan Himalaya. It has really a, an insight from the geological point of view, how we can understand the large and great earthquakes on the MHT. I think uh, you have said a light on our understanding why MHT is capable of producing large earthquakes or great earthquakes due to its brittle deformation or brittle you know, uh, characteristics. So I think we had a very good, uh, very good session today and uh, very elaborately you have shown with, uh, with your huge work in the Eastern Himalaya, in the Bhutan Himalaya, how the crystallography study of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, rock samples you have done and how you have come to this type of conclusion or you know inferences. So thank you so much. I think there will be some questions. And could I have a query from you that how the uh, you know, beyond the MHT or at the MH or at the I mean at the a ramp region, how the rock is conductive or little bit, you know, liquid structure there. Do, can you throw some light on that? Um, first of all, yes. sir, yeah. Uh, first of all, sir, thank you very much for your kind words. But there was um, some interruption in the sound. So can you please repeat the beginning yes. of your question, sir? At at the ram structure of the MHT. The ramp, yes. Yes, at the ram structure of the MHT, how the it is a conductive zone means that indicates geophysically that it's a you know liquid or liquid matrix is there. So how could we explain uh, this type of you know structure at the ramp of the MHT? Just a query from you. Yeah. Good. So it is. Um, good. 
So do you see my slide? Yes. Do you see my slide? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Good. So you're referring to this RAM. So there is a, a main Himalayan trust, which is flat beneath most of the Himalayas, and there is a ramp, and then yeah. again flatter. Yeah. Right. So the geophysical data do indicate it, but also we see it from the seismicity distribution. Most of yeah. the small earthquakes are triggered somewhere here. Yeah. But we could also uh, reproduce this by the thermokinetic modeling. Yeah. Now, what you're mentioning, you mentioned liquid, am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. conductive. So the rocks, right. So these rocks here, much deeper, are at temperatures are above 650 degrees. And for the quartz of felspatic rocks, like granites and gneisses, in, in presence of fluid, and I showed that there is a lot of water present, we are entering in the domain of the partial melting. Yeah. But it is not the whole rock which is molten, just components of the rock are molten. Just maybe quartz and maybe feldspar are molten, otherwise the rock still remains solid. And these molten parts, molten fractions of the rocks are between the grain boundaries and eventually are squeezed out into large bodies like dikes and even larger bodies like leucogranites. So this part yes. here is still solid, but much weaker. So the viscosity is several orders of magnitude weaker than the rocks that contain no um, partial melt. Okay. Uh, I'll try not to go into that. So these rocks are being also, or at least during the Miocene, 24 million years ago until 11, 12 million years ago, they're actually being, because being so weak, they were squeezed out between the coeval South Tibetan detachment. So here the rocks go down, this going up, and between the main central trust, which is almost parallel, but opposite sense of movement. So we have actually movement of these rocks out, up and to the south, opposite to the movement of Indian plate. At the same time, now Indian plate is coming in and is progressively being heated up. And part of it is then in deeper parts, beneath the southern Tibet, advected, added into the what is later the Great Yachnima sequence. And this incoming material doesn't have enough time to heat up to the ambient temperatures, and that's what causes on one hand the inverted temperature gradient, but causes this front of the hard material entering the weaker material. Yeah. So this yeah. lag in adjustment of the temperatures and rheology causes this ramp. So this is like a plunger, like a plug coming in along the detachment, but because it is colder, stronger, it creates a front, the ramp, and then progressively as it heats up, then becomes again um, low angle detachment. So just one more thing and then I'll stop. So yes, rocks here, at least during the Miocene, were partially molten and there are um, geophysical data that indicate there are some fluids, yeah. uh, which are probably chambers of magmatic rocks um, and uh, I don't have the proper image here, but at the level of the major uh, main human trust, but the deeper in the interior of the origin. Yeah. I hope I answered the yeah. question maybe yes. in one way. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. You're thank you. You're yes, I think uh, there will be some now questions. I think uh, you, you please attend that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Ms. Santora, uh, can you go for question and answer, please? Ms. Santora. I would like to thank the professor Jose for his informative presentation. So there are lots of queries in the community part. So maybe professor, 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 maybe um, sorry, actually, what is easier, maybe 
can you just write it in a chat? Because I really, can, do you have the access to the chat? If you can write yes, it Yes, yes, we do have, we do have, sir. You, we do have, sir, yes, sir, we can. Yeah. Mrs. Antara, may I request you to yes. write down the questions? Yeah. Yes. So it will be easier. So there yeah. very, uh, so may we proceed for those uh, questions? Uh, sir, the please last look one. into the published chats, published Q&A yes. section. You can see all of the questions. Oh. Um. Yeah, yeah. Those You're asking about possibility of low friction strength of the fault core. Sir, yes, sir. sir. Then extremely high fluid pressure. That might be the thermal yeah. pressure ratio. Is that the one? I see only the published questions. I don't see any new, most recent. So all questions are in the published sections. Yeah, I see published lecture uh, sections. There are 13 there. So I'm going to read uh, those questions one by one. So the top one is from Ankit Lohar. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Yes. Uh, so you're on his computer. Uh, OK, so you're talking about the GPS? Yes, sir. The question is, uh, is it possible to work with GPS data and thermal imagery for tectonic study or their movements? Yes, OK, sorry, finally, yeah. Um, OK, so I'll show that the answer to that. Oops. So I, I'm not sure for the thermal imagery, but what we have here, you can see the slide coupling of the main human trust. Can you see the slide, please? Yes, sir. Good. So what is here in the red color is the shading indicating the degree of the coupling. How strongly or how permanently is the basal detachment, the MHT, stuck together at the uh, time scale of GPS observations. So there are stations in the Meghalaya on the Shillong Plateau, in the foreland of the Bhutan, but also in the Bhutan. And what we can see in this color shading is that most of the MHT uh, has very high coupling over order one, that's maximum. So that means that at the time scale of GPS observations, so for example, if you had a GPS station for 10 years, there was no differential movement along the MHT. However, in the Eastern Bhutan, where I show the, our study, it's around this section, the coupling is weaker, both in the front and also in the deeper part. And we call these faults creeping faults. So uh, even at the shallow levels, there is some continuous displacement. Only at a smaller segment, there is no displacement or there was no displacement during the time scale of observations. And that is the segment where the stress is being accumulated and it will be eventually released in the seismic event. And this has to be done continuously and I'm not aware of many stations in Assam and in the Arunachal, but even these uh, stations in Bhutan are relatively scarce and uh, a paper just came out a couple of weeks ago, which I didn't uh, analyze yet. But that's what is possible to do from the GPS and to be honest, 
I'm not sure what can be done by the thermal imagery. Maybe you can enlighten me. Could you follow Thank my you, argument? So, 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 so may I go, go for next question? Yes, please. Uh, what is the next question is, what is the technique you, you used for estimating temperature in LHS and between ST and MCT? In the LHS? Yeah, OK, so the temperatures were determined by all the methods. So in, in the slates and the shales, I use the Rama spectroscopy on carbonaceous material. So that's the organic material that was converted into the carbon, but not yet um, uh, graphite. And by Raman spectroscopy, you, you obtain a spectrum, and that spectrum is then, then converted in temperature, which is estimated to be the peaked metamorphic temperature. Then in quartz, there are several methods. And first of all, what I am interested in is deformation temperature. And the quartz microstructure, the shape of the grains, the form grains, indicates approximately temperature, but also the crystallographic preferred orientation, the CPO, can be converted into the temperature. And the final method is the titanium in quartz, the concentration of titanium in the quartz lattice, which is the function of both temperature and the uh, um, pressure. And I apply that both across the whole lesser Himalaya, from the main boundary trust to the main center trust. And uh, that means also along the uh, Schumer trust or Ramga trust. People all call it differently. So I didn't show any study for the deformation on the Ramga trust or Schumer. I, don't, I didn't manage to acquire enough good or suitable samples. Thank you, sir. Oh, sir, next right. one is that. Uh, do you think this inverse temperature gradient would be accounted for uh, by the channel flow across the trust as, as has been suggested as a possible mode for inverted uh, Barovian sequence in Sikkim Himalayas and in general in context for the Himalayas by Godin and you? Yes, yes, I think so. Um, well, I advocate very strongly the channel flow, but uh, channel flow in these diagrams, what I'm showing and what I uh, uh, shown in the first, uh, um, in reply to the first question is happening at the lower depths, uh, greater depths. And it wasn't included in my discussion today because if you noticed, or I didn't say properly, all the modeling starts in our experiments at around 12, maybe 40 million years. By the time we assume that the channel flow in this part of the Himalaya has stopped or at this depth has stopped, and all the displacement is along the um, main Himalaya trust. However, what was happening before is that the channel flow in the deeper, greater depths cause, uh, leads to the higher displacement rates. That means higher advection of the temperature. If you remember, I mentioned the word Peclet number, which is a ratio between advection of the heat and diffusion of the heat. So diffusion of the heat is happening anytime at any surface and surface of the body. You're radiating heat by diffusing it out from your our higher temperature to the lower temperature in the air. But there is also heat production and heat advection in the crust and again, the, because of the channel flow, that heat is advected half, much faster than it can cool, so that inversion of the temperature is much more efficient. Once the channel flow stops, or in the areas where the channel flow stopped, the only advection of heat is because of the thrusting along discrete fault or discrete shear zone. Thank you, sir. So yeah. next one is there. Uh, what is the effect of a strong thermal uh, gradient on a rupture properties of a significant earthquake? Uh, 
Uh, can you please repeat? Sorry. What is the effect of a strong thermal gradient on the rupture properties of a significant earthquake? Well, when a earthquake occurs, there is a release of stresses along the ruptures, rupture surface and the stresses are then transferred. They are released in the earthquake, in the motion, but also they are released as elastic energy into the surrounding rock. If there is a surface rupture towards the surface, that energy is completely released. But sideways and towards the depth, that um, elastic energy is preserved or actually it is accumulated. So on the patch, on the surface, where there is a release of energy, release of stresses because of the seismic movement, part of the energy is actually then transferred to the surrounding rocks, to the surrounding patch of the fault, surrounding patch of the MHT that didn't slip. So on one hand, the stress is transferred down, down the dip into the ductile part, but also lateral, east-west. And that's your question. How much stress is transferred laterally depends on the geometry of the fault. So if you have a square fault, exactly square, then the sideways transfer is close to the size of the patch that has slipped. However, if you have a narrow and long fault, then the sideways transfer is very narrow. And we calculated for this earthquake in Bhutan for the earthquake of in 1714, then the transfer of stresses was minute. Even, and it was affecting, I mean, the lateral east-west, it was just few bars, not megapascals, but bars, so really small, and only in the area about 30, 50 kilometers laterally. So very small. There is, and if it was any effect, it would have been felt already in 1700s. Okay. For the time scale of 200, 300 years since that earthquake, that effect is uh, very small. Thank you, sir. Sir, actually there are lots of uh, questions. Uh, sir, may we proceed for some more questions? Maybe, maybe uh -huh. two more or <laughs> that, should, that should be okay. Yeah. Two more. Two more. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sir, next question is, do you think seismic, seismic boundary and brittle ductile transition are same? Um, which boundary, sorry? Do you think seismic, seismic boundary and yes. brittle ductile transition is the same? Uh, yeah. Yes and no. OK, it is a complex question, very complex question yes. that geologists and geophysicists just starting to realize. Okay. It is not a sharp boundary, first of all, in either case. And um, how should I answer it? We know much more about subduction zones, what is happening in that transition uh, in terms in terms of seismicity, on the other hand, in the Himalaya, we know much more about these transition type, types of deformation, deformation mechanisms. So I was talking about ductile deformation, crystal plastic deformation, and brittle deformation as if they are switching immediately from one to the other. But it's not so sharp. This transition is different for different minerals. And there is a progressive change that if you have the mixture in the rock, or both uh, plastic deformation and brittle deformation. So there will be progressing more and more overprint of brittle structures and microstructure over the brittles with time and space. So it's happening progressively. Now affecting the seismicity, what has been discovered only dozens of years ago, first in Japan, but now uh, of course, uh, British Columbia in Canada, at the west coast of Canada, and there is a subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the North America, is that there are tremors, very small earthquakes. So what 
what is happening is that, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the lecture, is that the stresses in the ductal part are transferred into the brittle part. So, because we have continuous motion in the ductal domain, that motion causes stresses in the brittle domain, which is not moving until it moves. And this boundary is not immediate, it is not sharp. So there is a domain along the detachment in the Himalayas, but also in the subduction zones, where there are, this transition is manifested in uh, small, very small earthquakes in the deeper part. So when the ductal deformation stops, the next step higher up at shell level with a domain which will not move immediately by ductal deformation, but will also not be able to accommodate high stresses, but every few months it will move with a very, very small earthquakes. And we are capable of measuring these earthquakes, which are smaller than magnitude one, just since few years. Before we couldn't measure because we didn't have sensitive instruments and also the uh, calculation the processing data is very demanding because the noise is much bigger than the signal. So it is it was required a lot of technological development to, to uh, find them. And these tremors, these very small earthquakes, uh, then transfer the stress to the next step. So you're going up on the steps higher and higher, and these steps become bigger and bigger. So these very small micro micro earthquakes that cause motion only on the order of microns. Okay, so there are micro earthquakes, but also micron displacement. They are also transferring now stress higher up, where the earthquakes happen less often. The rocks are, are stiffer; they can accumulate more stress, and the earthquakes are bigger. And finally, we get to the typical seismic domain, where the rocks can accumulate stresses over hundreds of years and cause magnitude seven and higher. Thank you, sir. So the boundary is not exactly the same. It's more complex. Yes. Please. Thank you, sir. Sir, so, uh, so next question is, what is the expected difference uh, between the seismic deformation in Himalayan megatrust and the subduction zone with active volcanoes? Okay, so that's something I wanted, I tried to explain in previous slide, or not previous slide, but previous question, answer to the previous question. Um, so the different, we don't, um, how would I answer it? Uh, to my knowledge, first of all, the seismologists did not register yet tremors in the Himalayas. It doesn't mean they don't exist but the seismic stations are just becoming sensitive enough to measure them if they occur and also it requires uh, demanding very demanding processing uh, capabilities so whether they exist or not i don't know simply they were not observed now in the subduction zones uh, the typical subduction zones the difference between the Himalayas is that we have very different upper and lower plate. And the rocks at the boundary between the lower and upper plate are ocean bottom sediments which are full of fluids and that could cause some difference, but we saw in Himalayas that there is also a very high uh, pore fluid pressure. So these are similar. now. In Himalayas, we don't have volcanism because uh, the temperatures are maybe high enough for melting, but the crust is very deep, thick. So the crust of Himalayas is 70, 80 kilometers thick, and most of the melt that is produced remains in the crust, doesn't get to the surface. Um, in the late miles, there was some volcanism in Tibet. Causes of that are in, to be found in the mantle and probably delamination of the subducting plate, which are not related to the seismicity. And this volcanism was much further away from the plate boundary. 
then it is typical for the subduction zones. In subduction zones, the volcanic uh, chain occurs at around 100 kilometers away from the trench, which correspond to depth in, at which the boundary starts to melt. Okay, this interface between the plates starts to melt, the rocks at that position start to melt. In Himalayas, that's in the upper plate where the, there is a melting, and it is occurring in the middle of the crust. So, uh, different causes of melting and magmatism, and in Himalaya, again, much more difficult to cause any volcanism because of very thick crust. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you very much, sir. Yes. Thank, thank you. Just I, I have a query, Dr. Grushik. It's a wonderful you know, explanation of the typical questions of geology and seismology. I have a seismology question to you. Oh. You have done extensive study in the Himalaya, in the Bhutan Himalaya. And in the Bhutan Himalaya, during the last, you know, uh, say last century, uh, we have not recorded any large earthquake. In a sense, you know, even the you know magnitude five earthquake is also not many. No. So now that's... you have done you have done extensive uh, rock study, the deformation study of the rocks in the in the Bhutan Himalaya. How do you think that the MHT is capable? of a large earthquake below Bhutan means that on the MHT, capability of the MHT below Bhutan to, produ uh, to produce a large earthquake. What is your comment on that? Uh, I don't have a final comment, but uh, there is evidence, as uh, Santanu can confirm, we were looking at the large surface displacement just a year and a half ago, so it did occur and the boundary between Assam and Bhutan. And uh, the, we don't know exactly where was the epicenter. It was probably the central Bhutan, not the eastern Bhutan. And again, currently, the coupling in the central Bhutan is very strong. In eastern Bhutan, it is much weaker. Why is it so? We don't know yet. Okay, it's just a, just a recent ob uh, observation. So maybe the hypocenter, really the slip area on the depth was not exactly in the eastern, uh, eastern Bhutan, but more in, towards the west where there's a strong coupling and then and the surface ruptured um, over much larger area. So there is a corresponding surface rupture in Guawati in Bhutan. I can't remember what is the place in the West Bengal. Uh, so the same earthquake or surface rupture that Santanu and my team observed in the eastern Bhutan and the Assam also was registered in the central Bhutan. So the surface rupture place is at least 200 kilometers long. Um, I'm escaping your proper answer, so I don't know yet, or we don't know yet, uh, what is the exact answer, but. Again, there is observation that there is some ongoing creep in the eastern Bhutan, probably affecting both Arunachal and Assam along the, uh, uh, what is the linear in Kopili? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Kopili. Kopili. So there is this strike slip uh, fault or seismic zone, which is also taking up some stress away from the main human trust in the eastern Bhutan and that part of Arunachal and maybe Assam. And we know that the Magnitude 7 did occur in this area. Whether they affect the main human trust, I'm not quite convinced that is the case. Uh, now, for the larger earthquakes, magnitude 8, with this current displacement, uh, it takes much longer than 250, 300 years to accumulate enough stresses. So, the, for the big earthquake to happen in this area, uh, we are still probably far away from that. Thank you. But Thank you. Magnitude, seven, magnitude 7 can occur anytime. But 8, probably not. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Sir, I really, Yes, sir. I really feel very fortunate to work uh, under your leadership in the Assam Bhutan border. And I learned many things uh, from the past uh, field, field visit. And thank you very much, sir, for your attention graving lecture. Uh, now, may I request Dr. Gautam Burwa. 
for his vote of thanks. Over to Gautam. Uh, good evening, respected dignitaries and participants. I am really privileged on being asked to propose a vote of thanks for the session. I, on behalf of CSR NIS and the organizing committee of IBWGSC, offer a sincere gratitude to Professor George Grohek for accepting our invitation and gracing the occasion with his presence and sharing his important findings and opinion with us. Sir, your lecture has enlightened us with the knowledge of thermobarometric changes and the dynamics of the Himalayan Megasus region and also the possibilities of large and great earthquakes. Thank you, sir. My sincere thanks goes to Dr. G. N. Sastri, Director, CSINS, for being so considerate and supportive during the session. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us today and inaugurating the e abstract volume. We are very much thankful to Professor Jia Kyle, former DGGSI, and Dr. Saurabh Barwa, Chief Scientist, CSNS, for chairing the sessions and sharing their valuable comments with us. I deeply acknowledge Dr. Santanu Barwa, Senior Scientist, CSNS, yesterday for his noble initiative on bringing in many, so many internationally acclaimed dignitaries to one platform and creating such a knowledge sharing base for the whole geoscience fraternity. I extend my heartfelt thanks to all the members of the technical and logistic support for their contribution. Last but not the least, I thank all of the participants for attending the event and making it's a successful one, and also for sending the research work to so featured in the EFT volume. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you again for organizing this, Thanks. and I hope uh, eventually I will be uh, in a situation to meet you personally in your great institution. And good, good luck. Thank you, sir. The, yes. Um, uh, next talks. Thank you, everyone, for participation and for the very interesting questions and. Sorry for any technical problems. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you, Santana. All the colleagues, thank you. Have a nice evening.